When it comes to the Essential Doctor Who Story Guide, if I don't talk about a specific book, audio drama, uh, comic story, or something like that, it doesn't necessarily mean that I think that they're bad. I have not listened to every audio drama, I have not read every book, I have not read every comic, uh, I haven't played any of the video games. They might be incredible, and I just don't know about them. Some of them I have listened to and I'm not including, or read and or am not including because I just don't like them. But uh, don't assume that. Uh, there's plenty of stories out there about Doctor Who uh, that are, are worth checking out, and uh, I would imagine, and I just haven't uh, paid attention to them. I will say, however, if I don't talk about a TV story, specifically a TV story from classic Doctor Who, you can assume I've seen it, and I, I'm intentionally not talking about it, uh, because I either don't consider it essential, or I just don't like it. Um, and... Uh, yeah, I'm not talking about Marco Polo. I'm not talking about it. That's all. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, we've officially caught up to where I initially started this series of the Essential Doctor Who Story Guide, An Unearthly Child. As I said before, the first episode, the first part of the first story, thank you, An Unearthly Child, is called An Unearthly Child, and that was what I was recommending there, mainly because the next three episodes in the first four-episode arc is a really goofy story about cavemen. It is... A fine story to watch if you want to watch it. I don't consider it essential, especially because it's very goofy and a little bit mm, problematic, I guess. I don't know. It just, I'm, I'm not a big fan of it. That first episode, incredible. Absolutely essential. The caveman story after that, not so good. However, very essential. Incredibly essential. Possibly one of the most essential stories in the entire Doctor Who canon whatever that is, is The Daleks. The seven-part story that takes place right after the first story, the very second serial in the whole show, and introduces the Doctor's most classic, most iconic, honestly, a, at certain points in his history, more popular than he is, enemy of all time, The Daleks. Exterminate! Exterminate! You know them, you love them, you've wondered why the hell they have plungers, Everybody has. You want to spend your Christmases with them. The Daleks. Incredible enemies. And uh, just like Darth Vader before them, in terms of like very popular space bad guys, uh, they are space Nazis. The Daleks, if, in case you didn't know, if you're unfamiliar with Doctor Who, are space Nazis with plungers for arms that are actually little... Uh, bubbling uh, squid-like lumps of hate uh, inside of big old pepper cans uh, running around with a whisk for one arm and a plunger for the other uh, just hating anything and everyone and everything that is different excuse me from them and uh, they are the perfect bad guys they are both scary and absurd at the same time uh, the perfect analogy for fascism and the doctor, uh, the, and the episode is also just an incredibly well-written character piece with this incredible character arc for the doctor where he starts off the episode being his chaotic gremlin self. And by the end of it, he's, he's truly encountered the ultimate evil in the universe. And you get to see the first sort of inklings of the hero, the superhero that he eventually becomes in this franchise. Uh, you get to see great character stuff from Ian, Barbara, Susan, the whole nine yards. It's one of the most perfect episodes of Doctor Who ever produced, uh, and it's incredible, and you need to absolutely check it out. All seven parts. Go watch it now. Right now. Welcome back to the Essential Doctor Who Story Guide. I really need a haircut, but we're not going to do that today. Instead, we're going to talk about Doctor Who, because that's the most productive thing I could be doing with my time. The Edge of Destruction is another TV episode from Season 1, one of my favorites, which is saying a lot, because I love Season 1 of Doctor Who. Non-spoilery things, because I am going to get into spoilers with this one. Uh, great story involves, is a bottle episode. They had to save money for one of their other stories, so they decided to set an entire story on, on the set of the TARDIS. Uh, the TARDIS is flying along. Something happens. The ship seems to be broken somehow. The, the crew is going crazy. Uh, lots of character development. Lots of uh, interesting little character drama stuff. Lots of great acting from the cast. Absolutely recommended. You should check it out. Getting into spoiler section, uh, the conclusion at the end of the episode, all of this stuff, this entire universe collapsing event, 
of the TARDIS about to be destroyed and take possibly all of our heroes and maybe the known universe with it is all because of one spring that was broken. One little tiny broken spring. That's insane. But it's insane in a very specific way. I've said in the past that I think that the the uh, the core of Doctor Who, the appeal of it for me, is that the Doctor is a madman in the box who is just as insane as the universe he inhabits. And I think that it goes further than that in that the ship is just as insane as the universe it inhabits and the man who inhabits it. The TARDIS is not a tame lion, to use the C.S. Lewis uh, uh, terminology. And it's, uh, it's a dangerous place to be, even though people call it home. It really struck me when I was watching Doctor Who that Doctor Who, in, to my mind, at its best, is very much in the same vein as Starstruck, the way it's described by Elaine Lee and Brennan Lee Mulligan uh, in the interviews they did around uh, the recent Dimension 20 season based around the Starstruck Odyssey. This idea of an extremely atheistic universe where shit is just sometimes bad and sometimes things are crazy and sometimes things don't make sense and sometimes a little spring is broken and that causes all of you to die ignominiously uh, very far from home and very scared and very alone off in the middle of the universe with only a madman as your guide and yet still at the end of the day you can choose to be kind and you can choose to be good and you can choose to be understanding to uh, the craziness and the, and the insanity of the universe. It's a very atheistic, it's a very humanistic uh, concept for a sci-fi show. I think it does an atheistic sci-fi future better than Star Trek, Star Trek does. Uh, maybe not better than Starstruck, but definitely better than Star Trek. And I just think that it's uh, at its best, and I do think that The Edge of Destruction is one of its best, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's something truly special. And I, 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 I love The Edge of Destruction. It doesn't get enough love, but you will love it now because you understand and you'll watch it right now. Do it. Welcome back to the Essentials Doctor Who Story Guide. If I kept the blonde hair I had when I was a little kid, I'd look like Colin Baker right now. Today's story is a short story from the short trip short story collection books that Big Finish used to publish back when they used to publish books and not just audiobooks. It's called The Ruins of Time, and it's a story about the first Doctor, Ian, Barbara, and Susan landing on a planet where time works a little bit differently than it does in the rest of the universe, and uh, stuff is crazy, and there are problems to sort out, and yada 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 Doctor Who. The sci-fi concepts at play don't always work, but it fits in with the first Doctor era in... Uh, in particular. The First Doctor era I've described in the past as being so creative it almost hurt the show. Nowadays Doctor Who has a very specific formula and they very rarely ever deviate from the formula uh, when it comes to how they tell their stories. But the First Doctor era was trying a lot of stuff to see what would stick. And so some of their stories, especially their sci-fi stories, are so creative and so wild and so crazy that they don't work. But it's really endearing how much they're willing to try and the crazy stuff that they're able to come up with. And The Ruins of Time fits right in there for me. But my favorite thing about this story, and the thing that uh, really makes it so that uh, it could never have been a TV story back when the show was originally on the air, is the implication that Susan is pansexual, and that on other planets and in the rest of the galaxy, uh, the gender binary that we uh, are forced to contend with on Earth doesn't exist. When I say forced to contend with, I mean it's such a cultural thing uh, that we all are forced to live with on this planet that uh, trans people, non-binary people, intersex people are forced to conform uh, to this gender binary uh, and when they really shouldn't have to. And in the future and on other planets and in the universe at large, uh, that is not a thing. It's also shown that Barbara is also not, doesn't have that much of a problem with the world, with the universe being this way. The only one who really has a problem with it is Ian, which makes sense, unfortunately. Ian Chesterton is one of my favorite companions in Doctor Who, but he is a stuffy British teacher from the 1960s. He's going to have some outdated ideas. But at the end of the day, Ian is a guy with a really good heart and really big heart. And even though he's from an era that gave him some outdated ideas, when he 
gets to know these people and he learns more about them and 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 learns that they're not really that strange or unusual he learns to accept them in the way that they are and uh becomes a better person and it's beautiful and it's a great little short story and i recommend it check it out welcome back to the essential doctor who story guide this is a t-shirt that i bought at kohl's that's a tie-in with the 1960s doctor who movie a movie that does not get an essential rating from me uh, the one with Peter Cushing that had nothing to do with the show. Uh, Coles, what the hell? Thank you. This shirt is awesome. What the hell, Coles? What the hell? Back to the TV show once again for The Keys of Marinus. Uh, this is partially uh, being labeled essential by me because it leads to another story that I think is actually a little bit better than this one, uh, which will occasionally happen. You know, essential sometimes just means it's important for continuity. But in, in reality, the story by itself is very fun, very silly, doesn't quite hang together, but it's very fun. And I love it. This story comes to us from Terry Nation, the guy who created the Daleks and who also created another little sci-fi show that uh, I recommend and has been recommended to me by many other people, Blake Seven. Which means he also created Firefly, uh, your daily reminder that Joss Whedon is a hack. It's kind of a unique uh, take on a Doctor Who story for the time. Again, Doctor Who stories, the way they were done on TV at the time, they were serialized. So you would have one long story over the course of several 20-minute episode parts. Uh, sometimes stories would go on for four episodes, sometimes two, sometimes ten. But this story is a bit unique because it's not just one story, it's several with a common through line. It's essentially the closest thing that uh, Doctor Who at that time had come to having uh, the kind of story that modern day Who has, where it's one long story over the course of a season with many mini stories in individual episodes that tie into the main story going forward. Doctor and his companions land on a planet and uh, a guy there says, hey, I really need you to help me finish my mind control machine. And the companions and the Doctor are like, what? No, I have a mind control machine, and the writers have decided that's good for some reason. Oh, okay, then we'll help you. There's, it's a little bit more complicated than that, but still, weird way to start your adventure, guys. He says there are several pieces to the Triforce of mind control that you have to go around the planet and collect. So they go around the planet to these various places all across the world and have all these various sci-fi adventures, at least one per episode, while they're collecting the bits of the Triforce of mind control and bring it back. Uh, to uh, this guy to help him mind control everyone on the planet. Very silly, very goofy, doesn't quite hold up, but essential because it leads to some very interesting stuff later on. Uh, so hold tight for that and uh, check it out. Welcome back to the Essential Doctor Who Story Guide, and oh man, oh man, this is, uh, I know I say that this one is one of my favorites a lot, but this one is one of my favorites. Big Finish has a lot of different series of Doctor Who audio dramas, but one of them is called The Lost Stories, where they take abandoned scripts from uh, the TV show Doctor Who uh, and uh, adapt them into audio drama form and produce them. So you can hear the sort of what-if kind of tales of, of various episodes that could have been made during the run of the series. This one is called The Fragile Yellow Arc of Fragrance and would have been a standalone 20-minute episode of the show that was abandoned because they decided that the show would be all serials and they didn't have any space for single uh, episode stories like this one would have been. As opposed to two uh, episodes for, of this series ago where there was an episode where the, uh, the TARDIS landed on a planet where the gender binary did not exist, uh, this is a planet where the gender binary exists real hard. Not only that, but if you ever fall in love, that's it. You are in love with that person forever. And if the relationship doesn't work out for whatever reason, uh, uh, you have to die. <laughs> There's no dating around. There's no, uh, I'm not interested in a serious relationship right now. If you're not interested in a serious relationship, you dead. And so is the person who, uh, you were, who asked you out. If that doesn't work out, it's either marriage or death. That's it. It's a wild and crazy concept for a story and a sci-fi story, but it's it's done so well. And in particular, I think the ending is so indicative and so 
naturally part of the first doctor's personality. I don't want to give it away, but it's just so perfectly them. And all the characters' voices are so perfect. And it's so such a sad and such a dark story. And I love it so much. It's so good. And I feel like it doesn't get enough love because it's just a bonus feature. It's a little 20 minute thing that's just a bonus feature that's included in a set of Doctor Who Lost Stories that is mostly made up of a really long lost story called The Great Macedon, or The Great Macedon, however you pronounce that, which is a story about Alexander the Great, which is very popular, people really like it, and I can't stand it. I think it's terrible, and I hate it. But The Fragile Yellow Arc of Fragrance is awesome. Check it out. They're coming for me. Welcome back to the Essential Doctor Who Story Guide, and today we're talking about the Aztecs. Okay, let's get through the good first, shall we? There is a reason why I'm calling this an Essential Doctor Who Story episode. Not only because it is a great episode with great acting and great character bits for all of our leads, uh, but it is also a uh, an important episode that establishes some interesting plot hooks for the show, at least for the first Doctor era. Uh, and it's it's uh, it's 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 very important. You also have my favorite Doctor Who romance in the entire franchise when the Doctor spoilers accidentally gets married because he didn't realize that Coco uh, was a marriage proposal in Aztec uh, countries. And some lady asks him if he wants to drink Coco, and he's like, "Yeah, I want chocolate." And uh, then he ends up married. It's very funny. It's very cute. Let's talk about the big racist elephant in the room, shall we? Doctor Who fans really don't like to admit that their franchise is racist. Can't imagine why they wouldn't want to admit it. Not like that's a super uncomfortable thing to admit about something that means a lot to you and, 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 and you really like that it's racist. In fact, you'll notice that every time New Who brings up Classic Who, they always make fun of the fact that it was sexist. And yes, there's sexist stuff in Classic Who, but far less than you'd think, considering how much modern day Who harps on it. I would say if I were to pick on any major sin of Classic Who, and especially the first Doctor era, it's how fucking racist it is. And unfortunately, the Aztecs is a big example of that. Now, I don't know if the depiction of the Aztecs is uh, accurate, the way that their society worked. And in fact, from what I understand, from what little research I was able to do, nobody does. Because the Aztecs were wiped the fuck out. So we don't know. Uh, maybe it's accurate, maybe it's not. Different scholars have different opinions, uh, trying to look through the wreckage of what was left behind. But it's definitely not okay that all of the Aztecs are played by white people in race makeup. And it's really not okay that the episode seriously implies that Cortez didn't wipe out the Aztecs based on his desire to exploit a native people and subjugate them, but instead wiped them out because of a moral imperative to do so because of their evil human sacrifices. So... If you're able to get past all of that to enjoy how good this episode is as a drama, I'm not saying it's not difficult. Check it out. Welcome back to the Essential Doctor Who Story Guide, and we're doing a two-for-one uh, today. The first up is The Sensorites. This is not an episode that I particularly enjoy watching. In fact, I would go so far as to say that it's really bad. Probably the worst of the first season of Doctor Who. Not for the same reason as the Aztecs. It's not very offensive or racist or anything like that. It's just very bad. The only things that are interesting about it is that it is the first Doctor Who story to take place in the future of humanity. Uh, and uh, much like a lot of sci-fi stories, the, the future of humanity in the Doctor Who universe is very Star Trek. Uh, there's a little bit more of... There's like time periods where Earth does exist and is a hub of human activity. And then there's a, uh, time periods where the Earth is long dead and humanity is a homeless race that lives out among the stars and stuff like that. But uh, in general, in the future, there is sort of a space fleet like, a, like the Federation that travels around. And in this episode, the Doctor and his companions find a crew of these folks 
uh, that are dealing with these weird aliens called the Sensorites. It's very badly written, but I'm considering it essential because of uh, one thing in particular, and that is the reveal that Susan Foreman has psychic powers. This will eventually be revealed as something that a lot of Time Lords have. In one uh, book I read, the Doctor states that uh, he also has psychic powers, which is which is a thing in the show, but he's not the best at them. He never really worked on maintaining or developing them the way that some other members of his species have. But Susan does have psychic powers. This is something that is introduced in this episode and never brought up again in the TV show. But I do consider that essential, and partially because the very next episode I want to talk about is The Transit of Venus, uh, which is a audio story from Big Finish, one of their Companion Chronicles episodes, which is a story that takes place right after the Sensorites and specifically deals with the fallout of that reveal. Uh, it's a historical episode where Ian and the Doctor, but not Susan and Barbara, oh no, arrive on a famous voyage uh, and talking about the transit of Venus. And it, it's, it's very interesting, all the stuff going on there. But what's really interesting is the follow-up stuff to the Sensorites that ends up making the Sensorites episode feel like a better story in the same way that reading Darth Plagueis makes Star Wars Episode One: The Phantom Menace feel like a better story. It doesn't actually make The Phantom Menace a better story. It doesn't actually make The Sensorites a better story. But it feels like a reward for having watched it. <laughs> so, check it out. Welcome back to the Essential Doctor Who Story Guide. Adderall is all that keeps me functioning, but it's also slowly driving me insane. Back to the first season of televised Doctor Who, with actually the season finale of that season, The Reign of Terror, where they go back in time to the Doctor's favorite period in Earth history, according to Susan, uh, the French Revolution. I can just see the Doctor in the uh, Big Finish audio drama in the beginning, where he's watching that video about Earth history, uh, just getting to the part about the French Revolution being like, ooh, there was a time when they ate their rich, how thrilling. It's a great episode. Unfortunately, part of it is lost because the BBC had this weird policy back in the day where they used to burn their old film cans. They would just burn their old stuff uh, rather than rerunning it. And uh, uh, yeah, that's really frustrating. And a lot of Doctor Who episodes are just lost forever. Uh, with all of the lost episodes, however, we do have the audio tracks. So you can either listen to the audio on its own with narration to tell you what's going on, or you can watch the lost parts of this story uh, on the DVD with animated reconstructions. The animation is not very great. They clearly didn't throw a lot of money at the animators, but uh, it's still there and you can enjoy the whole story, even though technically two, I think, episodes of the serial uh, are considered lost media. But the most interesting thing about it in terms of its place in Doctor Who history is the way it deals with time travel, specifically expanding on the ideas introduced in the Aztecs. In the Aztecs, the Doctor says that not only should you not rewrite history, not one line, but you can't rewrite history. God will come in and just stop any changes you want to make before you can make them. In this episode, they expand upon it to the point where Ian and Barbara ask, hey, we met Napoleon in, in this episode, don't ask, and uh, what if we had just shot him? This is before he did all the crazy stuff that he would eventually do. What if we just shot him and stopped all that? Wouldn't that be changing history? And the Doctor and Susan say, look, the bullet would just redirect itself. Something, God would just, like, change the fabrics of, of reality. Uh, Zeus would call upon the fates, the weavers of fate, and they would change reality just enough to make sure that uh, you couldn't change history. Modern Day Who fans are scratching their heads at this, and that's because it's no longer canon. It was decanonized at the end of season two of the show. It didn't last very long. I think it was initially introduced as a way for them to keep doing historical episodes without the fans constantly asking them about the butterfly effect and why every episode that they went into history, Ian and Barbara weren't terrified that they would unwrite their own existences. But the most interesting thing about it has been, in my opinion, the way that the Fanon writers, the writers who wrote the books and who wrote the audio dramas and everything, have played with this concept and, and uh, played with the transition between the two ideas of how time travel works in Doctor Who. And I think it's very interesting. Uh, episode's great. Check it out. 
Welcome back to the Essential Doctor Who Story Guide. Today we're talking about Rise and Fall, another entry in the Big Finish Short Trips series, this one on audio rather than in book form, and it's a story about the Doctor and his companion, specifically Ian, landing on a planet where time works a little bit differently, and things are weird, and it's very interesting, it's a very good story, and that's really all I have to say about it. Like, I, I want to include it because I do think that it matches the criteria for what I recommend as essential Doctor Who stories. Uh, it's not necessarily important to continuity or anything, but it's it's really, really good, and uh, I think that it would behoove you to listen to it, but um, uh, without uh, spoiling anything, there's not really much else I can talk about about it. So, um... um I guess some of these are just not that interesting. Not the Doctor Who stories, these videos. Um, Rise and Fall, Doctor Who Short Trips. Check it out. Welcome back to the Essential Doctor Who Story Guide. Today we have a bit of a weird one. Today's story is the Masters of Luxor, another one of the lost stories uh, uh, from Doctor Who years past. This was originally going to be the second story, but was replaced by the Daleks. Uh, and it's, 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 um, hmm. You can experience it two ways. You can experience a big Finnish audiobook adaptation of it, uh, like I talked about with the Fragile Yellow Arc of Fragrance. Uh, I have not listened to that. I've heard that they changed it a lot from the original script. Or you can read a published version of it. That's how I experienced it, where the only changes that they made were were, uh, making sure everything was consistent because the version of the script that we still have is basically a rough draft. So they just sort of polished it up and published it as is. I'm not recommending this because it's good. And I'm not recommending this because it's important to continuity because I certainly don't really consider it canon, which seems antithetical to this whole series now that I think about it, but it's just so weird. Again, when this was written, there was no blueprint for what a Doctor Who episode was like or or what kind of stories they would tell, so people would just throw out whatever, and Masters of Luxor is... Uh, I guess the best way I could describe it is it's about a planet of robot vampires? Kind of? But the weirdest thing about it, and I've mentioned this before in the series, Doctor Who, to my mind, is probably the most successful, biggest, uh, most popular, strictly atheistic sci-fi franchise. Even Star Trek, a franchise that was often very atheist, still ducked into some Christian theology on more than one occasion. But Doctor Who is extremely atheistic, and this episode is straight up Christian propaganda. It's, I think, attempting to be a dramatization of an old theological argument, which is that if you can't, the reason why, how you know that there is divine truth is because you can always imagine something better than what you have. You can always imagine a better version of that. And that's because you are linked to a divine concept of the perfect version of that thing. You have an idea in your head uh, that you are living in a fallen world and nothing can ever be truly perfection. Uh, your ability to imagine a better version of what you're looking at is because in the f world the way that God wanted it to be before the fall in the Garden of Eden, uh, it would have been that perfect, and you're aware of that on a subconscious level. It's a complicated argument that I don't fully understand, and this episode appears to be trying to turn that concept into a science fiction, in into a science fiction story with robot vampires. So, yeah, not canon to my mind, and certainly not great. Uh, also weirdly horny. Uh, it has nothing to do with what we're talking about, but the script is weirdly horny. Uh, check it out if you dare, I guess, would be my rating of this one. Welcome back to the Essential Doctor Who Story Guide. Look at my cat! So cute! Look at her! Oh my goodness! She's snuggling up, she's snuggling up, and the gigantic people-sized poof, and just a little bitty kitty, just a little, oh, she's just little blinking, she loves me so much. Oh goodness, oh goodness, daddy love you too. Oh goodness, oh goodness. They were talking about Return to Scarrow. The Doctor and his companions, once again trying to return Ian and Barbara to Earth, accidentally instead return to the planet Scarrow, where they initially met the Daleks. And things have gone rather well, uh, uh, for the, the denizens of this planet after the Doctor and his companions d defeated the Daleks all those years ago. Uh, and uh, now there seem to be some rumblings that maybe the Daleks are back. Who knows? Are the Daleks back? This is Doctor Who. 
we all know that the Daleks only ever appeared in one episode. It would be crazy to bring them back now. Pardon my sarcasm. This episode is decent, and I am recommending it. That's the entire point of the series. But, oh man, I have problems with this show. When I say this show, there's a specific series of Doctor Who audios that this is from. It's not from uh, the series of audios that I normally recommend from. This is from the series specifically, where instead of having the old actors from the old show come back to reprise their roles, those that are still alive anyway, they have the cast of that 50th anniversary Doctor Who movie in Adventure in Time of Space, who played the actors who played these characters, play their characters. So David Bradley's the first Doctor, and so on and so forth. The first and big biggest problem with the series is always the writing. They come up with these great ideas like, let's make a new Doctor Who story to fill in some of the plot holes and inconsistencies in the Daleks' appearances between episodes in the first Doctor era, and uh, just don't do anything with it. Instead, they just decide to do a half-hearted remake of uh, The Power of the Daleks, uh, one of the greatest Dalek stories ever, but... If you're just doing a half-hearted remake of it, why am I not listening to that right now? And on top of that, David Bradley's performance, and I love David Bradley, let me be clear, is an impression, not a performance. William Hartnell as the first Doctor was chaotic and insane. I call him a chaos gremlin for a reason. His performance could go be like, one day I shall come back, or it could be, <laughs> get off my ship, or it could be, <laughs> He was crazy, but apparently David Bradley only watched one clip, the clip where he said goodbye to Susan. So he says every line like this, like he's a, one of those singing Cybermen from the 10th planet. Oh, dearie me, do you have any emotions, sir? I want it on record. I love David Bradley. I think he's an incredible performer. I loved him in those movies I grew up with him in, where he played uh, the caretaker in that movie. Th those those movies about the trolls. What were they called? Was it The Worst Witch? I think it was The Worst Witch. There's so much potential packed into the show, and the fact that they consistently do not deliver on that potential is extremely depressing to me. That being said, of the episodes from the series I've heard, this is definitely the best. Check it out. Welcome back to the Essential Doctor Who Story Guide, and today we're doing a double feature because there are two stories that we're going to talk about that I just don't have as much to talk about with them as I normally do. Look at my shirt. Uh, mysterious color, uh, unlike any scene on Earth. This is from uh, the uh, uh, Overly Sarcastic Productions video about H.P. Lovecraft from several Halloweens ago. Uh, I just love that joke so much, I bought their shirt about it. Uh, I wish it glowed in, the, glowed in the dark. I don't think it does, but uh, that would be awesome if it did. Uh, idea for the next merch line, uh, overly sarcastic. First, we have The Library of Alexandria, produced by Big Finish. Uh, great little companion chronicle story, that's the name of the series that it's in, about Ian getting a job uh, working at the Library of Alexandria and the library being taken down. Slight spoilers here. Uh, most First Doctor historicals, uh, as I've mentioned previously, are just historical adventures with no alien interference or no sci-fi elements except for the fact that they take a time machine to get there. This one does have alien monsters in it, but I feel like the way that it's done doesn't feel disrespectful to the tone of the First Doctor era in a way that a lot of other stories that do the same thing uh, do feel. It also does a great job of uh, building the relationship, the OTP relationship that I ha imagine between Ian and Barbara uh, in a way that a lot of fans imagine, in a way that doesn't feel too forced or weird the way that a lot of uh, fan and writers uh, make it out to be. You can ship them all you want. Again, I ship them too. You just have to make sure the relationship feels like the relationship they had on the show. Otherwise, it doesn't feel like them anymore. You know what I mean? Next is A Star is Born, which is another great little big finish story. This one from their short trips line. Uh, it's just a great little short little adventure uh, with some really messed up dark ideas. Uh, I feel like it kind of craps the bed in the ending where, uh, again, spoilers, things are uh, cleaned up a little bit too neatly, in my opinion. Uh, I would prefer something more like the Fragile Yellow Arc of Fragrance, uh, in which uh, you're left with more questions than answers. I like that kind of stuff. But I understand that sometimes uh, you want a nice happy ending, especially when you've been dealing with some dark subject matter. Uh, and so, hey, uh, definitely worth checking out. Both of these are. Uh, check them out. Welcome back to the Essential Doctor Who Story Guide. I'm about to get a haircut, so say goodbye to this nonsense. Talking about A Little Piece of Home, another big finish short trip. Once again, not a lot to say about it, because I can't really say much without spoiling it, other than to say it's absolutely perfect. I think it's one of the greatest Doctor Who stories of all time, if not just one of the greatest first Doctor stories. So since I've already run out of things to say without spoiling things, uh, other than check it out, I'm going to instead talk about the character of Barbara. Modern day Doctor Who likes to rag on classic Who 
for being sexist because they don't want to talk about how racist Classic Who is. But Barbara is an example of how, while Classic Who was in fact sexist, I do not want to take that away, uh, Barbara was a standout moment of like, hey, maybe the show isn't as sexist as people remember it being because Barbara is badass. Obviously the presence of one badass female character does not make the entire show not sexist. I'm just saying the show was not as unaware of its own problems as people seem to think it was, at least when it came to women. Racism, completely unaware of its own problems, but feminism, not so much. I saw someone on Tumblr describe Barbara as being the real brains of the operation in the original TARDIS crew, and I feel that in my soul. I think that's so correct. Barbara is the most rational person on the TARDIS crew. She has her emotional moments, she has moments where she loses control or, or makes an irrational decision, but far less than most of the rest of the crew. She is actually actively brilliant and is the only person on the crew that the Doctor respects so much that he almost apologizes to her. Doesn't, but almost does. But because she doesn't take no shit and is smarter than all of the men on the crew, Doctor Who fans, being a bunch of sexist assholes, uh, decided that she is the difficult one. Basically, Doctor Who fan and writers have decided that Barbara is the Skylar White of Doctor Who. And I have read through and listened to so many horrible fucking Doctor Who stories that I have not included here, in which the TARDIS crew is always like, oh, adventure, excitement, interesting, and Barbara's back there being like, I miss Earth, and I hate it here. Barbara did take things more seriously than other people because she was the adult in the room. She was the practical one. Everyone else was, was, was lollygagging around, and she was like, okay, we need to take care of things. That doesn't mean she was difficult, and it doesn't mean that she was uh, some kind of no-fun-zone idiot uh, asshole Skylar White character. I'm sorry, Skylar White. Skylar White's great, but this is the way people treat Skylar White, too. She had her funny moments. She had her emotional moments. She was a full character, and she was really cool, and people just write her as to be so lame all the time. In this story that I'm talking about today, uh, there is a bit of that sort of like, Barbara just wants to go home bit, but it makes sense and it's not overdone and it's kept within her character. Uh, so if you want to hear this horrible thing done right, listen to this one and check it out. Welcome back to the Essential Doctor Who Story Guide. We're talking about The Last Days. I've said before that my favorite Doctor Who episodes are the ones that indulge in horror. Uh, and unfortunately, the first Doctor era is very light when it comes to that. I still love the first Doctor era with all my heart, but the horror elements that Doctor Who will later become famous for don't really come in until the second Doctor era. Most horror that happens in the first Doctor era is stuff dealing with the fallout of World War II in England. Uh, England was still very much dealing with the repercussions of the Second World War in the 1960s when the show first premiered, and so you have a lot of episodes that deal with that. In particular, the first Dalek story, in which not only are the Daleks based on the Nazis, but one of the good alien characters, the Thals, in the story is a clear representation of former British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain. With Ian, our strong, square-jawed British hero character, clearly portraying uh, a Winston Churchill-esque figure in the story. Another element of the First Doctor era that's uh, a huge part of it is the way that you are not allowed to change history. Not one line. But the ways in which that is portrayed, at least in the first season of the show, are through the Aztecs, an episode that is, all again, very racist, and through uh, the French Revolution episode in which the tragedy is undercut somewhat by the fact that the episode is depicting both sides, both the rich and the poor, as being uh, inherently evil to some extent and inherently brutalistic and how this conflict can't possibly have a good outcome. Last Days does an incredible job of combining both of these elements to create such a dark and fucked up story that it just makes my twisted black little heart happy. The Doctor and his companions are dropped into the middle of an ancient war between a clearly good force and a clearly evil force in which good ultimately lost. They cannot change history, they must merely ride out the wave of history and try to survive. And Ian, unfortunately, has been, has found himself caught on the good side of the war during the battle where everything was lost in one of the worst and darkest ways that they could have been lost. There is no way out. There is no reset button or sudden happy ending. The horror of the situation must merely be endured, must merely be survived. 
and Ian, our hero, our square-jawed Winston Churchill stand-in, must merely look on and even participate in one of the darkest and most horrifying historical events that he has ever witnessed during his travels with the Doctor. It's a brilliant little short story, a little short trip. Check it out. Welcome back to the Essential Doctor Who Story Guide. Now we're going to talk about A Long Night. Based on the last video that I made and a couple of other videos, you know that uh, my uh, taste when it comes to Doctor Who tends to be on the more fucked up and dark side of things. But let's talk about a story that uh, is not that at all. Fans of the Matt Smith era of the show know that Doctor Who is not just one thing. It's not just one tone. While the Matt Smith era of the modern day show did have a lot of horror episodes and made freaks like me happy, it they also had a lot of romantic and fairy tale inspired stories that made other twisted freaks like you happy. And one of my favorite things about the first Doctor era, genuinely, is that it was a, a, a whole new show back then, especially in the first season, where all of the stories that I've been talking about right now have been set in. Uh, it was a brand new thing. It could be anything, and it was anything for a while. There were all sorts of different genres tried out for the show at the time. Anything could happen. And so sometimes, like the last video I just did, you would have horrifyingly depressing stories like The Last Days. Or you would have stories that feel like they were written by H.G. Wells, like the original Dalek story. Or you'd have stories that feel like they were written by H.R. Haggard, like the Aztecs. Or you could have a story like this, A Long Night, that feels more like a romantic fairy tale. And when I say romantic, I don't mean a love story, although it is a story about love. It's about familial love. I mean romantic in the sense of uh, the sort of more general, generalized idea of romance, like how swashbucklers are considered romantic even if they aren't currently in love. This is also a fun story because it talks about, in a very sort of magical realism kind of way, the idea of what the hell did people think was happening while Ian and Barbara were missing for two years. For those who don't know, slight spoilers for later on in, in Classic Who, but when Ian and Barbara were returned to Earth, they were returned to Earth the year the show was coming out at the time. So they were gone in the TARDIS for a full two years. The Doctor finally returns them to Earth two years after he picked them up. So people definitely noticed that they were gone. And over the years, as many writers have written for them, they've come up with different explanations for what was going on uh, in England during those two years, how people were reacting to it, who were the people that they left behind, what was the state of their family. But this is definitely my favorite version of that. Basically talking about the relationship that Barbara had with her mother before she left and uh, how her mother is getting on now that her daughter has been missing for about a year. It's a great, cute little story that doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but certainly makes you feel good for a little while. And hey, check it out. Welcome back to the Essential Doctor Who Story Guide. Today we're going to talk about A Room for Improvement. This comes from one of the strangest short story collections of Doctor Who that I've found. Uh, another one of the short trips collections. This one's centered around the city of Prague. Just a series of stories where the Doctor visits Prague. Because it's one of his favorite cities. I guess. Prague. Anyway, this one particular story, the Doctor and Ian, not Barbara and Susan, they've decided to s stay in the TARDIS and hang out, but the Doctor and Ian go out into the city of Prague, Prague, to find out uh, why it's so empty. Why has everybody gone away? What's, what's, what's going on in Prague these days, the Doctor wants to know. Turns out that there's a de deadly, virulent plague going on in Prague. It's the Prague Plague. It's the Plague Prague. And so the doctor runs to the nearest hospital and starts uh, putting his vast knowledge of alien uh, medicine to the task of studying this plague and conquer it. And what I love about this story is that I don't think that of the many genres Doctor Who has embodied over the years, I don't remember there being any other story where it was a medical drama. And as much as the doctor always claims he's not a medical doctor, he is a doctor with a lot of various different kinds of knowledge in his head, including some medical knowledge. And the fact that the show is literally named after a character who is a doctor, it seems like 
that would be an obvious place to take the show, to have at least an episode be a medical drama. And again, I don't remember it ever happening in any other story, except for this one, and it is really, really fun and really, really interesting and cool. And I just dig the hell out of the story, and I think that you will too, so check it out. Welcome back to the Essential Doctor Who Story Guide. This is a snowman, he's my friend. This is a skeleton, he is also my friend. This is a penguin, do not talk to his son. This is a- Just get on with it! Yes, get on with it! Right, so remember when I told you that uh, I didn't really consider The Keys of Marinus to be a particularly great episode of Doctor Who, but it was kind of important because it set up some stuff later on down the line? This is one of those stuff. It's called Domain of the Vord and expands upon the villains introduced in the keys of Marinus, the Vord, which were basically just a bunch of guys in wetsuits in that episode, and didn't really have a lot of stuff going on behind them, except that they were the evil people who want to mind control everyone to do what they said, and not the good people who want to mind control everyone into doing what they said. So here comes Big Finish to fill in the plot holes, or not plot holes, but the, the empty spaces in, in Canada City once again. So you know how uh, the Daleks, another creation by Terry Nation, are essentially space Nazis? Well, the Vord are now space Klu Klux Lux Clan. Basically still fascist, but a slightly different kind of fascists. I guess a little bit more culty, although the Nazis were plenty culty, but like a different kind of culty, I guess. It takes the very, very little that there was about the characters in the original Keys of Marinus. It expands upon them in a great way. Uh, it's the only, I believe, instance where the Vord are portrayed this way. There are other stuff where the Vord comes back later in other Doctor Who stories later on down the line where they are depicted very differently because they were written by different writers at different times, and those stories are also interesting, and we'll eventually get to them. But this story in of itself is extremely interesting, very fun, very cool, uh, uses the characters uh, of this era of Doctor Who very well extremely good episode. I greatly enjoyed it, and I think you will too. So absolutely, please, go check it out. Welcome back to the Essential Doctor Who Story Guide, and today we're talking about the flywheel revolution. I need to sit down. I know I say this far too often, but this really is one of my favorite Doctor Who stories of all time. Another big finish short trip. This one about a, a little robot with a time issue. He can't tell the time in his head. Uh, traveling along on a planet full of robots in a gigantic planet-wide junkyard, uh, traveling through the junkyard, and he sees a monster, an evil, twisted, terrifying monster with pink, fleshy skin and a sort of white fungus growing off the top of its head, dressed in strange garments and guarding jealously a, a huge, terrifying-looking cave in the shape of a blue box. Star Trek often claims that it's about infinite diversity and infinite combinations, but most of the time when you meet aliens in Star Trek, there's just the same five British actors uh, dressed with weird, bumpy head, forehead makeup. Doctor Who falls short of its premise and promise as well a lot of the time, but when it does make it work, it really makes it work. And some of my favorite Doctor Who stories are the stories that really uh, take you out of yourself and put you in the mind and in the perspective of an alien observing humanity. After all, the entire show centers around the main character, the Doctor, who is an alien observing humanity. The companion characters are there for us to relate to, but that's really a gateway into the real trick of the show, which is making you relate to the Doctor, a full alien with thousands of years of experience. At the end of the day, the Doctor may look like us, he may be humanoid, but his sympathy is not with us simply because we look similar. His sympathy is with whoever he thinks happens to be in the right. He doesn't see much difference between someone who looks like you or me or someone who might look like, I don't know, one of the Roswell aliens or something even more alien or strange or even these robots on this junkyard planet. And even though the first Doctor is one of the most taciturn and, let's say, selfish of the Doctors, even he has sympathy for a creature that looks nothing at all like him and thinks in a way that is both alien, strange, and even somewhat uh, unnerving to the Doctor. Doctor is not a perfect character. In fact, I have many times said that he is in fact a madman with a box and not a tame lion. But his greatest strength at the end of the day is that, like Peter Capaldi's Doctor, the 12th Doctor, once said, he's an idiot 
just passing through and trying to do what he can, trying his best to be the best version of himself that he can be. And really, what's more relatable than that? Check it out. Welcome to the Essential Doctor Who Story Guide, and once again, we are talking about one of my favorite Doctor Who stories of all time, a story that I love so much, I bought it twice. I actually bought it first as a downloadable audiobook through Audible, and then I loved it so much after listening to it that I bought a physical copy of the book, because once Amazon inevitably and quite deservably burns to the ground, I don't want to have to miss out on having a copy of one of my favorite Doctor Who stories very unusual that I actually have a physical copy to talk about with, with one of my Doctor Who stories on the series, so rather than me recapping it, let's read the back of the book. The TARDIS arrives in Salem Village, Massachusetts, 1692. The Doctor wishes to effect repairs to his ship in peace and privacy, and so his companions, Ian, Barbara, and Susan, decide to live history for a week or so. But the friendships they make are abruptly broken. When the Doctor ushers them away, wary of being overtaken by the tragic events he knows will occur. Upon learning the terrible truth of the Salem Witch Trials, Susan is desperate to return at any price. Her actions lead the TARDIS crew into terrible jeopardy, as her latent telepathy threatens to help the tragedy escalate way out of control. Actually, that was a great idea. I couldn't have said it better than that. There's an unfortunate tendency in a lot of stories, uh, fictionalized retellings, I should say, of the Salem Witch Trials, to say that, yes, the witches were real. You know, those witches that they lied about and said were real so that they could kill undesirables in the town of Salem? Those witches were real! Hey, I like Hocus Pocus as much as the next guy, but seriously, cut it out with that shit. That's offensive as fuck, man. And this story does what I don't think anyone could have predicted a Doctor Who story would have actually done, and just takes the Salem Witch Trials incredibly seriously, and just tells an extremely gritty and grounded and faithful version of the actual historical events, just with Doctor Who characters there. I went into it expecting for them to pull the same sci-fi bullshit everyone pulls with the Salem Witch Trials, and instead, they took the events with just as much gravity and seriousness as they deserve to be taken. It also does a great job of finally transitioning between the Season 1 Doctor Who understanding of time travel, where uh, it's impossible to change history because God or Zeus or whatever uh, stops you whenever you try, and the modern-day version of Doctor Who, where you can't change history, you, it's very important that you not do that, but uh, you can change history, it just would cause a lot of very serious issues if you did. And what's the transition? How, how do they transition between those two explanations? What is the explanation for why time travel works differently after season one of Doctor Who? Uh, it's an explanation Modern Who fans know very well. Rule number one, the Doctor lies. He lied about how time travel worked all of season one. They could have changed history the entire time. Terrifying. It's a nearly perfect Doctor Who story that you should check out. Welcome back to the Essential Doctor Who Story Guides with uh, one little uh, double feature before we get to some really heartbreaking stuff coming up. First, we're going to talk about Here There Be Monsters, a big Finnish companion Chronicles audio drama that takes the infi infinite diversity and infinite combinations thing that I was talking about that Doctor Who kind of embodies, even though that's a phrase created for Star Trek uh, a little bit ago, and kind of takes it to the nth degree, which is, does the Doctor see the good in everyone? What about eldritch Lovecraftian monsters from another dimension? Still? Okay. That's pretty much all I have to say about that episode. It's a great episode. It focuses mostly on the character of Susan Foreman, which is great considering what's about to happen in the next episode. Spoilers. But it's just, it's just good. Check it out. Next story we're going to talk about is the first story of season two of the television show called uh, Planet of the Giants, which is about the TARDIS. As all Doctor Who fans know, TARDIS is an anagram that stands for Time and Relative Dimensions in Space. And there have been plenty of Doctor Who episodes about about what if the uh, time and space part went bad, but this is an episode about what if the relative dimensions part went bad. The TARDIS lands, and unfortunately has developed a fault, once again, what a shock, uh, but this time with its relative dimensions. And it's super tiny, and in order to not kill the people inside the ship, it's made all of them super tiny too. So they've actually managed to get Ian and Barbara home to their to their time period. The Doctor has done it. 
but only in a very sort of, uh, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids kind of way. Yes, this is literally Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, but with the Doctor and his companions. And to give it a little bit more uh, high stakes, uh, there's also a world domination plot involving insecticide and a murder that the Doctor and his companions have to solve while also being tiny. Neither one of these stories is really here for any reason uh, about, like, how, like... Uh, important they are to continuity or important to your understanding of the series. They're just fun. They're just fun. I think they're fun, especially Planet of the Giants. Here There Be Monsters is, is fun in a different way, but uh, Planet of the Giants, uh, just it's just more time with these characters and with these actors. And unfortunately, as much as I love Big Finish and the books and the short stories, uh, since the actors created these characters in their own way, uh, and unfortunately at least half the cast has passed away since then, we don't get as many, as much time with this cast as we do with a lot of other casts from the history of Doctor Who. So it's just nice to enjoy every second of what we have while we have it. And especially since there's about to be a big change coming up in the next one. So check it out. He was bred the whole time. That was a reference to an old college humor video. My name is Billy Martell, and this is the Essential Doctor Who Story Guide. Today we're talking about the Dalek Invasion of Earth, which I've talked about a lot on this channel already. I don't know what to say about it at this point. If nothing about this series, no video I've ever made before has ever made you want to watch Doctor Who, classic Doctor Who, if, if you just don't think it's going to be for you, you just don't think you're ever going to be into it, uh, check this out. And if you still don't like it, it's probably not for you. This is one of the greatest Doctor Who, classic Doctor Who television stories of all time. Even though we've talked about multiple Dalek stories at this point, this is the original story that brought the Daleks back. The Daleks had their first episode, it was good, it was great, people liked it, and the Daleks went over so well. People got so excited about the Daleks that they decided to bring them back for a sequel story in the second season, and that was the story, the Dalek Invasion of Earth. This time, the Daleks are coming to your hometown and they're pissed. True, the Daleks are always pissed, but now they're pissed outside your house. It's also the episode that introduced one of the most fundamental and important concepts in all of Doctor Who. Change, my dear. It seems not a moment too soon. Carol Ann Ford, the actress who played uh, Doctor Who's uh, granddaughter, uh, Susan, uh, decided that she was tired of doing the show. She had been promised in the original pitch to her about who her character was going to be. Uh, a whole bunch of stuff, a whole character arc, psychic powers, a whole bunch of stuff that the TV show version of the character never really got to explore on camera. Tired of being the damsel in distress, always the idiot child who twists their ankle and gets everybody else in trouble and screams their head off at the drop of a hat. She wanted to move on to other things and uh, you know more power to her she's a working actress she's she's got to make that decision it's sad for the fans of the show that she had to leave the show but it was her decision and and we're happy for her here because of that susan the doctor's granddaughter potentially the most important and most significant companion that the doctor as a character has ever had on the ship in the show leaves the show is the first character to leave the TARDIS. At the end of this episode, she decides to leave the TARDIS crew, well decides, and uh, decides to move on and start a new life on the uh, newly freed from the Daleks, sorry spoilers, uh, planet Earth. It's one of the most consistent and best things about Doctor Who is that it is inconsistent. It changes over time. The first Doctor era is nothing like the fourth Doctor era, is nothing like the fifth Doctor era, is nothing like the tenth Doctor era. The show changes, evolves, morphs, mutates. Actors leave, actors come in, and it's beautiful. Check it out.